All right. Good morning, everybody. Great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, Brother Tom Jelenic couldn't make it. Apparently, one of his cows uh, got lost in the storm last night, so he won't be with us, but uh, uh, praise the Lord. Anyways, um, you'll notice I'm not as good a singer he is, as he is, so I'm going to count on you all to sing extra loud to help drown me out. But let's all stand and we'll sing praise to the Lord by turning to number 628. My Savior's love. Amen. Number 628. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how marvelous, my song shall be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the day. And he prayed not my will but mine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood on mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my soul. In pity, angels behind him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows. He bore for my soul that night. Marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall be. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered my own. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul. And the last, when with the ransom in glory, his face I last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. to be here this morning. We had a wonderful night last night. Many of you were there. We had a sportsman's banquet. We were just going to do a little sportsman's banquet with our people. And then uh, I talked to the, the fellow over in some prairie and I said, you know, can we use your gym? And then he just kind of said, we can do this with you. And so it was just a blessing. And uh, the equipment and everything, the sound, everything went really well. And uh, the biggest winner, though, was Kyle Peterson right over here. He, he won a black powder gun yet last night with a scope, uh, mounts anyway. And so well, what a blessing. It was just really neat. And then my, my sons were able to uh, win a few things and grandsons. It was just a good time to be together with like-minded believers and be able to have some food and some more food and some dessert and some more dessert. But uh it was a good time, and so you that were there, you know what I'm talking about. So we're going to do it next year, and looking forward to that. And then, again, we just really appreciate all those that were involved. We had a good week. Uh, everything's going well. The, the little difficulty last night with all of the rain, some of the rain even came into our facility here a little bit. And uh, last night I got done, I don't know what time it was, Brother Daryl, late last night. Uh, we were done, and I was heading over to the gas station, and hail was coming down, and it was windy, and... Uh, but I withstood it all and pumped the gas in myself. Remember the days when someone else would do it for you? 
Yeah, now nah, that means you're old. So be careful about the saying amen on that. I'm glad you're here this morning, but there are parts of the world that are going through some difficult times. Um, I got another video. I'm not going to show it this morning, but uh, Brother Vitaly's home is now full with refugees, and and um, he gives the reason why he has stayed. I did put it on GBC News, and so if you're not part of GBC News and you'd like to be, um, talk to someone that knows about Facebook and so on. Uh, they'll get you attached in. And uh, if you wanted to just give me your name, I can add you in. And so we'd like for you to be able to see all of that. And then this, the prayer needs come up daily. And so it'll help you a little bit more to stay in contact with Grace Baptist Church. Our website tells you a lot, but not enough. And so, but I'm so glad you're here this morning and I hope God continues to bless you. But we've got to keep our, our prayers going up for the country of Ukraine. And so uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to this country. We know that there has been divine intervention here. Um, Lord, we know our purpose, but Father, I pray that you would revive the hearts of the pastors. I pray that they would seek you with their whole heart. I pray that they would understand more of, of what their need is, um, show them. Lord, I pray uh, for our country, but then I pray also, Father, for, for you, the Ukrainians. Lord, there are some people that just want to live in peace and raise their family. And uh, Putin would like to destroy um, to gain. And that's the wrong way, Father. I pray that you would help the country, that you would help the Christians. I pray especially for those that are on the east side that are the missionaries and the pastors that have been coming in contact with Brother Tim Smith and others. Lord, I pray that you would be with us, that we would be able to keep praying for Brother Vitaly, and that you would comfort him now, that he would sense your presence there with his family, but also his neighborhood. Uh, Lord, I pray that he would be able to share the gospel with the refugees that are coming in. Lord, I just pray that your hand of, of divine intervention would be there with them. Protect them, Father. Lord, I pray for the president of Ukraine. I pray that you will give him wisdom from heaven how to deal with this. Lord, I pray for our own administration that they would please come to the need of these Ukrainian people, that we would be able to use the airports in Poland and Moldova down even in Romania, Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to help the Ukrainians. Father, I pray that you help us to, as Christians, to know that this kingdom is of this earth is not ours, it's, it's yours, and if you want to do with it as you please. But Lord, help us to realize that we are of another kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and I pray, Lord, that you'd help us not to hold on to things too tightly here. I ask this, this morning that you would touch the hearts of all of the believers and all the members and friends that are here this morning. But I pray also, Father, that you would be with those that are at home today, that they would hear the message, that they would see the need and meet the need. Father, I pray that you would help us as we gather together now and greet one another, that we would have the Christian love that we need to be able to support and edify one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit down, 16 hands. Shake if you would.
All right, if you could please make your way back to your seats. We'll go ahead and continue the service. Please make your way back to your seats. My dad was a farmer, but uh, that was before I was born. Daryl remembers those days, but I guess uh, I, I still know the difference. There's a difference between sheep and cows, but you know, hearing about Brother Jelenic looking for the lost cow, I couldn't help but think about the story of uh, that Jesus told about the the shepherd who left the ninety and nine to look for the one that was lost. So I guess we're the ninety and nine this morning. But uh, let's turn to number two sixteen. God leads us along. Number 216. Number 216. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the waters cool flow, bathes the weary one's feet. God leads his dear children along. So through the waters, through the blood, so through the fire, but all through the blood, so to great sun. It's a song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mark where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley in the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through grace, God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're so glad you could join us this morning. If you're a first time visitor, first time here, or maybe the first time in a very long time, please raise your hand. As the ushers go past, they'd like to give you a visitor's card and a gift. Please fill out that visitor's card and put it in the offering plate as it goes past in a few minutes. We'd really appreciate having a record of your visit. Thank you for joining us today. Now, Brother Jerry will come and present the missionary report. This week's missionaries are the Slobodians. They open with this psalm. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Psalm 46, 1. Dear pastor and friends, hello from the Slobodians. As we write this letter, our hearts, along with everyone else, are deeply concerned over the developments we are watching on the news as Russia has launched an invasion of Ukraine. We are especially concerned for our missionaries whose lives are in danger as Russian forces advance. Currently, we still have many Ukrainian families supported by BIEM and numerous Ukrainian partners, as well as one American, Bruce Tuttle, in the country that need your prayers. For now, most of our Ukrainians are staying where they are, though some may try to get to Western Ukraine. This is also the case with Bruce Tuttle, though he may try to get to the Republic of Georgia, if possible. One of our friends, who is a businessman, is trying to get out of Kiev and get to the Western Ukraine, but he has been stuck in traffic for over 12 hours now and is making little progress. We are grateful for the phone calls and emails we have been receiving expressing concern for these dear people. There is a question all are asking, which is, other than prayer, is there anything we can do? First of all, we cannot underestimate the importance and power of prayer. Please pray that the war somehow be halted. Pray for the safety of our missionary families and ministry partners. Pray for the peace of God to rule the hearts and minds of believers in Ukraine. Pray that believers will perceive and act on an opportunity to share Christ with fearful, unsaved ones around them. Beyond prayer, there is going to be a huge need for funds. Before the invasion, prices for food, fuel, and other necessities had more than doubled. Now that the invasion is taking place, this will only get worse. Currently, Ukrainians are able to withdraw funds from banks, so we are transferring relief funds to our Ukrainian missionaries, and most of them do have bank accounts. You certainly can help with this effort by sending donations to BIAM designated for Ukraine relief. Your do no donations will help these families in this crisis, which will certainly continue for some time. If you don't have not yet accessed it, please review this month's video update. This is a video that we seen last Sunday. The video features Eugene and Vitaly requesting prayer for Ukraine. Following us is a song which is a prayer for Ukraine. The song is sung by Eugene's daughters, Sal Salmia, Angelina, and Ivanka, from left to right. During the song, you will see pictures of our Ukrainian families that need your prayers. Please click on the link or paste it to your browser. Finally, we share this message from our missionaries, the Kellers, who are in Ukraine. We thank God for the Ukrainian armed forces who protect us every day from further Russian invasion. We thank God for the Ukrainian, American, and European leaders who are actively seeking diplom diplomatic solutions for the Russian aggression. We thank God for you and your prayers. It is God who still holds Russia and gives relative peace to Ukraine. Please keep on praying. Thank you very much for your prayers and for your support. May God bless you and bless you, the Ukrainians, the Sabodians. Thank you. Please take your bulletins. We'll look at some announcements. Of course, it's the first Sunday of the month, so this evening we'll have our Lord's Supper service uh, during our regular evening service time, and we'll also have uh, praises and testimonies. Um, on the 13th of March, which is in one week, there will be a special business meeting after the morning service. On the 19th of March, there is a Best Mexican Food Fundraising Dinner at 5 o'clock p.m. here. I think Pastor will have some more to say about that in a moment. Uh, April 8th through 9th is the WFBC Ladies Retreat at Green Lake Conference Center. I'm sure those of you who are planning on going have already been planning on it, uh, but of course, Mrs. Howell is the one to talk to about that. And then on the back, uh, on the bulletin board, out those doors are the sign-up sheets, as usual, for the dinners for the Maranatha students, uh, the snacks for the teens on Wednesday night, and the uh, meals for the RU on Friday. Thank you. Pastor. You know, last night my son was a speaker at the banquet and he was talking about why do you do what you do? What is the purpose behind it? And he knew his audience. He was speaking to the sportsmen. But I, I think about, uh, you know, pastoring and running a church and seeing how we do things. I remember uh, coming into the church years ago and, and uh, Pastor Dow had blue carpeting and white on the walls. There was nothing up 
on the walls at all. And I had, I'd asked him, you know, uh, just had a question concerning that. And I said, what what was behind that? And he said, I just feel it needs to be as plain as can be. And uh, and his thinking. And so why do you do what you do? We ended up putting, of course, a cross up here. And we did this platform. And we did a little bit of different carpet. We painted the walls, did some things to make it look a little different. Um, there really wasn't anything bad with it being blue and white. Um, but it was why we do what we do. And when it comes to that particular thought, when it comes to that, you know, uh, fundraisers were always something that I thought we don't need to do that. Even with the Access Woman Center having a fundraisers, I think it was better for mission support and so on. But fundraisers are necessary at some times. There is, it is necessary now as we try to raise the money for our building program. The Spanish speaking people wanted to do their part and they said, we're willing to cook and use our money. If you want to go ahead and put us some money on, on the uh, offering to the people, you come in, instead of getting your ticket, you're just saying, I'm giving this to the offering, to the building fund. But if you want the best Mexican food in town, uh, you come and join us uh, on that night. It's going to be an awesome night. I wanted to encourage you as a family to come. I believe there is a price on just for the families when they get there and also for the individuals. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more in the future as we get a little closer uh, to it, but I wanted to also tell you that in in the insert uh, there is one from um, the, the 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 church connection from the Wisconsin Family Council. They are working 24/7 to keep the churches aware of what's going on in the political world. Along, you know, and, and abortion is one of those issues that they bring out, marriage, uh, so and so on. And um, so this is for your own reading. It comes once a month. And uh, so this is March that's in it. And also for the, for the week, we're talking about relationships this month. I have chosen to speak on Jesus Christ every single Sunday and his kingdom. And so, but this particular devotion for you for tomorrow night as a family is dealing with relationships. And uh, how many do you think uh, relationships are needed? Raise your hand. You know what? That's part of your security. If you look around you and you see people that are struggling in the area, you ushers can get ready if you would uh, for the offering. As you look at people around you, you say, that person looks awful strange, or why are they putting all of those piercings in them? Why are they tattooing themselves up? Because they're a little insecure. That's why they're doing it. And, uh, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what they need is a relationship with God, absolutely first, and then relationship with others. And the better our relationships are, and the more relationships we have, the more secure as an individual we are. We, we will have more security. Uh, if you run away from people and don't have good relationships and put walls up, you're going to struggle in the area of security. You're an insecure person. And uh, I'm not trying to be mean this morning, but uh, the best thing you can do is just when you don't feel like it, come to church. Um, do things sometimes when you don't feel like it. That's the real person. And so if the men come, we'll take up the offering. I wanted to encourage you that after the service tonight, we need to take up another offering for a family. Many of you don't know Anna. Anna's been coming to church here for several months. About how many months has she been coming here? Anna is uh, probably a year ago. About a year. And her husband, Ricardo, um, they were married and then they uh, were separated. And uh, he was a Pentecostal uh, pastor at one time. And, uh, but she has come here and found good doctrine and good friends and so on. Uh, but Ricardo got sick and um, they put him on a ventilator and it doesn't look like he's going to make it. So they're going to bring the daughter in today and um, take everything off of him and um, say goodbye to him. So I would like to take up an offering for Anna. She's a widow. Um, not yet, but will be. And so I want to take care of that and, and, and do what we can do um, after the service. Uh, think about what God is going to lay upon your heart, what you can give to help her. Uh, she's a wonderful lady downstairs. Probably, I would say, I better not even say, I don't know how old she is. So, yeah, just keep that quiet. Ladies are sensitive about that. So, Parker, can you thank the Lord for the offering, please? Thank you, Lord, for
Thank you, Carolyn. Praising the Lord all the day long. Praising my Lord. Let's all stand and sing number 613, Singing I Go. Number 613. for the script reading. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this, this morning, uh, oh, before I read the scripture this morning, uh, all the junior kids are dismissed. And then uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 this morning. I'm going to be reading verses 26 to 35. And then uh, we'll read verse 30, 33 all to, uh, excuse me.
33 altogether is the key verse. So, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when, he, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall, shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come unto, upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And if we could read verse 33 altogether, please. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us today. I'm thankful that everyone was uh, able to make it this morning. Uh, I pray for the rest of the service, the special music, and uh, for Pastor Sermon, that you would give him strength as he's preaching this morning. Uh, I pray for the evening service and uh, every, that everyone would come back tonight for the Lord's Supper. I pray for the rest of the week that everyone would travel safely. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated.
In 1922, a long time ago, there were three regions, portions of land that wanted to unite, and they did. Those uh, that don't understand or don't un really know geography very well, all of these regions were north, if you would, and west of the Black Sea. Below these regions, there was Bulgaria, of course, and uh, Moldova, and there was the Romania, and then below uh, and to the east a little bit of Bulgaria would be Turkey. Um, these regions desired to be able to come together and make an agreement, and that became the USSR, 1922, December 1922. Um, I think that what's going on today in that particular region of our world is something similar to a desire to get that back, the USSR. We know it as the Soviet Union. We know that uh, there was a desire to have independence by the Ukrainian people. They have been under oppression through the years by Germany and then also by Russia and uh, were able to get their liberty and their freedom for many, many years. They've had the ability to be able to go back and forth and have the same thing that we've had here, all of these lands. And I've, all the pastors are saying that they're hoping America will wake up and realize how well we've have, had it all these years and, and realize on the world scene that things are happening and we can't stick our head in the sand. We would like to do that. We would like to say, well, America's going to just go back to where it was like. And no, the whole world is changing, folks, whether you like it or not. And I think the next land that will be underneath the oppression of a dictator will be the land of Taiwan. And so we need to pray for that. The two world leaders are coming together, and uh, that is uh, Putin. And also the leader of and the president of China uh, have made somewhat of a pact, and we're thinking about how we would respond. I know I'm getting a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a few uh, texts from people that are talking about pastors that are on the east side. This morning I put it on Messenger uh, that they did have services yesterday. They not only had services, but on the way through checkpoints. Now, whenever a country is under war, there's going to be certain places that you can't go, certain bridges, certain roads, and so they put up checkpoints. And so these pastors had to go and hit seven different checkpoints, uh, had to show their papers who they were seven different times uh, to get to church yesterday uh, and, and to realize when they got there that the place was packed now, I had been in Romania after Ceausescu had died, and I was able to go into churches when they were packed. Now, it didn't matter if they started on time, because as one point when I was going to preach in a small town, I was wondering when I was going to preach. Josh, you were thinking last night, I'm going to be preaching soon, so you're, you're thinking, you know, when is that coming, you know? And, uh, and I asked the pastor, I said, uh, the, the translator, when am I going to speak? And he said, we're not going to go to church till the cows come home. I thought he was just joking with me. And uh, so we're sitting in this little village, and we're hearing these clip clap clip clack, and people were already coming. Uh, we were just two blocks away from the church, and I could hear them singing. I could hear them uh, speaking, standing up. I could hear all of that going on. And I'm thinking, well, I'm the one speaking. I probably should be up there. They said, I'm not going to go until the cows come home. And I'm um, sitting there in a chair, and all of a sudden, this cow went by the window. And... Uh, Literally, they come like crazy. Oh, time to go to church. And so we got into this little buggy and horse, and we went up to the, they're about 100 years behind there at the time. It was 1994, somewhere in there. And I, and I got to go into the house of God where the people were standing room only, 
and they had old instruments on the walls that were all banged up, and they grabbed their instruments, and then they went to the platform, and they played them, and then they had me speak, and how do you speak to these people? I had an interrupter, of course, you know, and, uh, but it was a really a, a joy for me to see the freedom and the liberty that they sensed, and uh, I said, even with being in bondage, you can still have the Spirit of God with you, but it is wonderful when you can gather and be able to uh, preach the Word of God and see each other, and so it is now in the Ukraine. And they're experiencing this. Ceausescu, of course, was, was shot, and I got to see in, in, um, in uh, Bucharest, I got to see the building that, that he was standing in giving a message when he was shot, uh, when he was rushed away anyway. And uh, I, I was thinking about how that these people now are, are living lives where the, the missiles are coming in. How many have been in combat? I know that when I was in Lebanon, we were having uh, missiles coming in all the time, and they were ruining buildings. Um, going out and seeing all of that, every day it looked a little different. More buildings were, 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 were you know, uh, blown up, and uh, more missiles hit, more people died. Um, and, and seeing all of that and, and seeing war and hearing of the rumors of war and seeing all of the things that COVID did to us and the, the mandates through all of that and seeing what's going on in the banking system in the world. And, and it, you know, it looks pretty ripe for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we're thinking about Putin and his desire to move into the Ukraine and to go back and to take these three regions again and, and kind of revive the USSR, that's what he's doing, and making a name for himself and be able to, and he'll do anything he can to achieve that. He will blow up a nuclear plant and he will eliminate a lot of lives just to accomplish the USSR again. And uh, will he achieve it? Um, I don't know. It's up to God, isn't it? Up to us as the United States, if we would uh, not like to have World War III being thought about, but it's something that we should maybe think about and maybe prepare for. If you do not know how to can food, I think you should. Go on YouTube. If you don't know how to butcher a deer, go find out how to do it. You don't know how to catch fish and fillet it, learn how to do it because we may need to go back to that someday. The Ukrainian people are running for their lives. Pretty soon it'll be two million people have left the Ukraine going into Poland, fleeing this madman that wants to revive the USSR. 1922, December. Here we are 100 years later. Maybe December is this goal. Maybe he wants a 100-year anniversary celebration of the USSR. It is a possible thing. And as we think about this particular uh, contemporary issue that's happening in the world today, as we're thinking about that, how are you doing concerning your kingdom? Are you of this world that you can go ahead and, and live in this world? But I'm so thankful that I'm part of the kingdom of heaven. I'm so thankful that I'm part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So I was thinking about what I wanted to do for today's message, it couldn't help but go back to Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can look at this particular uh, geniusness of writing. It, it starts out with an introduction, the first four verses. Many of you have never really seen the introduction and looked at it. This is an introduction. This is a preface to a book, and he writes it. Luke, he's a physician, very well put together, and God chose him to be able to put this together and for us to be able to have it. After he's done with his introduction, he announces what's going on when it comes to Herod and uh, the king of Judea, the days of Herod. He talks about the course of Abiah and Zacharias and Elizabeth. And uh, both of these were righteous before God. And so God was going to bless them because they were blameless before the Lord. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and we know that John the Baptist had come out of all of this, and as we understand that he was going to have a cousin, if you would, um, humanly speaking, and his name was going to be Jesus, and all of that is actually announced in verses 26 through, through 35. But as we look at just for a few minutes here this morning and understand 
that there was a verse here that I want to point out, verse number 33, it says, and he, he shall reign, talking about Jesus, over the house of Jacob, or Israel, if you will. Um, and by the way, I've been thinking about this a lot lately concerning the nation of Israel, that uh, um, it, it talks about how that the end days that, that Israel will be uh, encompassed about. We're talking about the nation of Israel, the nationality of the Israelites. We're talking about nations, sometimes we think of location. Do you realize that there are children of Israel that live in America? Do you realize that? Do you realize that there is going to be a gathering again of Israel back to one location in Israel, and they are going to come back together, all of them fleeing to that land because they are going to go through persecution? Kind of interesting that the president of Ukraine is Jewish. I learned about that a little bit more of how that he has been involved with uh, what happened in World War II with his dad's family and how that three of the brothers were killed. And of course, his dad was the only one left. And then, of course, he had this son and they're pretty proud of their boy running the Ukrainian uh, as the president and also staying there and saying, I'll fight with you. I think of Vitaly this morning and I'll show this video of tonight maybe or maybe next Sunday about him saying, why am I going to stay here? It takes a lot to stay in one place if there's a war. What would you do? I remember listening to Dr. Daryl Champlin saying, I'm going to stay here in the Congo during the, the war there and how the family stayed through it and how they were able to abide there with the, and you know, when the, when the war was over, the people loved him even more, even though he was a white man. There's nothing wrong with being white, by the way. Just in case you were wondering, nothing wrong with being black or brown or tan. I, uh, I always am impressed with tan people because I just, I go outside and come back in, and I just get beat red. I get burnt bad. And I get blisters. Everyone say, aw. And I feel better now. But when it comes to this kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and it, this verse talks about Jesus here, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob. He shall reign over the house of Israel forever. And the kingdom, uh, his kingdom, there is no end. And there shall be no end to that kingdom gives me hope. It gives me uh, encouragement because if I'm part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, then I have hope that there is no end to his kingdom. As we look at it from a biblical perspective and a, and a prophetic perspective, we remember what Jeremiah said, that there's going to be a rock that was hewn out of the mountain, the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, and he was going to fall onto these kingdoms and he was going to crush them. The kingdom of Jesus Christ will crush all nations. So if you think that Putin's a big shot, he's just a little bitty little red ant is what he is in God's eyes. He's a small, you think, well, he's big stuff. No, he's not. He's not a man. Putin sits 12 feet away from anybody when he has a meeting. Not because of COVID. Because he's afraid that the people around him might take a knife and cut him. But when I was thinking about the kingdom of heaven and, and, and putting it all together, I couldn't help but read this from a small article. It says, in his 1942 devotional called Abundant Living, E. Stanley Jones, a Methodist doctor and missionary in India, wrote these words. He said, the early Christians did not say in dismay, in dismay look what the world has come to. But in delight, they would say, look who has come to the world. They saw not merely the ruin, but the resource for the reconstruction, if you would, of that ruin. They saw not merely the sin that did abound, but the grace that did much more abound. And on that assurance, the pivot of history swung from the blank, or from blank of despair, and, to, and, and loss of moral nerve, the fatalism, if you would, to faith and confidence that at last sin had met its match 
that Jesus Christ was going to be able to conquer sin and death. And when it comes to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we know that all power was given unto him. All power. He is, he is capable of doing anything because he is Jesus. And so Christ was content with maybe just a stable when he was born so that we could have a mansion when we get to see him. I thought about that, and each of the Gospels actually bring out a little more. I was thinking about Matthew and how that the Gospel of Matthew portrays him as Christ the King, and how the Gospel of Mark shows us that Christ is the servant, if you would. The Gospel of Luke speaks of Christ the man, and the Gospel of John proclaims Christ's deity. I like John. It seems like there's more sensitivity to the world from John, he's able to express that Jesus Christ is the answer to the problems of this world. I think if you were in Ukraine this morning, you would see many uh, civilians being attacked, uh, attacked also. Right before the service tonight, I was at home going over some notes and so on, and then it came up that one of my friends in Ukraine had sent a video, and I watched people. Um, just were coming across the street with their luggage. We're blown up. It's sad. But that's part of war. And it, it hurts my heart. I think that if you've been to missions, I know, Bob, you've been overseas, and you've seen people, and you're, you fall in love with them, and your heart is with them, and my heart is with the Ukrainian people this morning. My, my heart is with the kingdom of heaven this morning for those that have trusted Christ as their personal savior. And I was thinking about the opportunities that these people are having. I got another video that's on uh, the Beam website. I was looking at that one also. I contacted Sam Saboni, he texted me back and said, look at this video. And I was watching that video and there's a pastor saying they're using their church for a refuge. He says, I've only got them for a little while. They're coming in with their luggage or staying overnight for a few nights and then they're feeding them and then they're on their way as they travel to the West by foot to try to get out of the country. See, we know none of that. We're comfortable. We're gonna get into our luxurious cars today after the service is over and we're gonna be able to turn the music on and kind of forget all of this. But let me tell you something, the world is a mess in that part of the world anyway. And I, and I want you to know that what's happening is they're getting closer and closer to the one world order, even when it comes to the finances, one world bank, one world religion. And so let me talk to you a little bit about every time we talk about the birth of Christ and the Redeemer. A lot of us are focusing on him as the Savior. We're focusing on him probably have, perhaps as a little boy growing up in a carpenter shop. We're thinking about him as there is portrayed, I think, in that the Chosen has put together all kinds of different stories as you can watch and be able to see what was happening in the Bible days. It's interesting to see it all. But I want to zoom in on something and talk to you about the fact of Jesus Christ being the king of kings, if I can. That Christ is the king of his kingdom. It's interesting that Luke brings, not, brings out not only Christ as man, but also here in our text, he brings out Christ as a ruling king. In Luke chapter 1, you have it in front of you, verse number 32 and 33 says, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Matthew puts it this way. Now, in the days of Jesus, or when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of, of Herod the king, behold, there came men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews. For we shall, or we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And so if we're focusing on Jesus Christ, not as a baby in the manger, and not as a person in the carpenter shop, and not just as our savior, if you would, or the resurrected Christ, uh, we want to look at him as being the king of his kingdom. And every kingdom as a king. 
I think it's important for us to understand the origin of his kingship, if I can, for just a moment. Where did he come from? He came from above, and he shall reign. Daniel chapter 2, verse number 44 says, In the days of these things shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and, and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The book of Daniel says in chapter 7, verse number 9, and I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of days did sit, whose garments was as white as snow, and the hairs of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as the burning fire. This is speaking of Jesus Christ in the book of Daniel. And the reason why I know that, because it goes back in Revelation chapter 1, the Bible says, in verse number 13, it says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt with a paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were, eyes were as a flames of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass and as if they burned like a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Pretty powerful statement because it's talking about the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And in the seven churches that were involved, which I believe is a chronological order of time, and I believe we are in the Laodicean church, and I believe that it is close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1, it tells us, and after these things, the church age, I saw a door that was open in heaven, and, and, and a voice, and someone had shout, and of course, immediately, he was in the presence of those that were in heaven. John saw these things. And John connects with Zechariah, of course, because of the prophecy. In John chapter 12, verse number 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king comes, sitting upon the Anassas colt. And when we see Jesus in the manger, we tend to think of the Savior, the Redeemer, the Deliverer. And these are not wrong views. Don't get me wrong. We should, we should look to him as, as the Savior and so on, but he's also the king. He's the king of everything. When I think of a king, I always think of, uh, of somebody with a big, long ro robe, a red robe with a crown on his head. Don't you think that way when you think of a king sitting upon his throne and having his jesters, if you would, or his people sitting next to him? The Bible gives it very clear description, but we see Jesus here according to Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. We know him as Christ the Lord. But this is clearly referring to his kingship, if you would. The term Christ is also referring to the anointed one. The origin of Jesus Christ is from above. That's where he came from came out of eternity and was able to come into time. It's one of those things that kind of just blow your mind a little bit, but the authenticity of Christ is in the scriptures, and we believe this by faith. The term Christ is also referred to the anointed one. In the Bible times, when somebody is anointed, it's talking about kings and priests being anointed by oil. They were then ready to rule. So there's a royal dignity with the anointed one. There is also the royal status, if you would, of being the king. There was also the royal sovereignty, if you would. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 11 says, And when they were come into the house, they saw a long, young little child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened up their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh because he is the king. You see, sometimes we forget that he is the king from above. The origin of his kingdom. Let's talk about the object of his kingdom for just a moment. What is the object of his kingdom? What is the object of Putin's kingdom? We already know that. I talked about it. What is, what is the object of your desire? Are you the object of it? Are, are your perception of people, is that the object of your desire to perception? How do people see you? 
You, you know, I go back to tell you this, and I say it again. You have the audience of just one. And make sure that you know that before God, you are truly his child and that you do desire him. And so I was talking about the object of his kingship, and I put this down, all who come to him. And so he shall reign over the house of Israel, over Jacob forever, and for his kingdom there shall be no end. So we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus Christ my king personally? Is he personally my king? Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. Some may say that he is the Savior, but he isn't just Israel's king, according to the scriptures. He can also be your king. And every soul that comes to Christ will have the peace from a Savior who loves us, from a God who cares and who will provide for us just like a king would take care of his people. Is he on the throne of your heart this morning? Then we ought to obey him. I think obedience is evidence that someone is born again. The Bible says in John 15, verse number 4, New Testament, you are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, or in the Greek, since you belong to me, and since you are my friends, you should do whatsoever I command you. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Hereby we do know that we know him, because he's our Savior, if we keep his commandments, so the king has commandments. He saith, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This is kind of difficult for me to talk about, but yet it isn't. That somehow we think that we can be disobedient to God and still call him our king. Now, this is a very serious thing because we're talking about a narrow road versus a wide road. It, it talks about those that are going to be his disciples will say, listen, I'm going to lay my life down just like he did. I'm going to pick up the cross and I'm going to, 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 to pursue him and not my own desires. And so this world wants to, a savior, but then they want to choose their own king. And they usually choose the one in the mirror, unfortunately. I think Samuel, if you want to write it down in Samuel's warnings toward those looking for an earthly king in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 22, give us that understanding of those that are looking for a king. But I want to take an insert, if you would, uh, something that I had read, and I want to put it down as far as who Jesus Christ is. Because if we're looking at, at him being the king of a kingdom, and we being part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who is he? Well, the Bible says that he is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of ages. He is the king of heaven. He is the king of glory. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Taking this from another pastor, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is internally steadfast. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is supreme. He is preeminent. And he supplies strength for even the weakest of us. He is available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes. He saves. He guards. He guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives sins. He discharges the debtor. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He, he, he rewards the diligent. He is the key of knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is the pathway of peace. He is the roadway of righteousness. And he's the highway of holiness. Amen. He is the gateway of glory. He is the master of the mighty. He is the captain of the conquerors. He is the head of the heroes. He is the leader of the legislatures. He is the overseer of the overcomers. He is the governor of governors. He is the prince of peace. And he is the king of kings. That's who Jesus Christ is. And that's who we are part of the kingdom of Christ. He's the Lord of lords. And his mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. 
His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteousness. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. The preacher goes on to say, I wish I could just describe him to you. He is incredible. He is incomprehensible. He is invincible. He is irresistible. He is the witness that cannot be rejected. And Herod could not kill him, and death could not handle him, and the grave could not hold him, and the grave cannot hold you if you have been part of his kingdom. And we are the objects of this king, the heavenly king. Our heavenly king desires complete obedience with a whole heart, all of our love, complete trust, unaltered faith, the best of our times, the best of our days, the best of our offerings, the best of what we have. He deserves all of that. Selfless service, never for your benefit, but for his. I was watching yesterday as people were setting up in the gym, young little girl about 10 years old vacuuming the gym. The last thing I did last night was say, Thank you, Brother Darrell. I'll see you tomorrow morning as he's vacuuming up water from downstairs. Maybe a small task to some, but he's taking care of what God has given him charge over. And let me tell you something. It's not me, folks. When Grace Baptist Church is going to be judged, it's not just me. It is all of the servants of Grace Baptist Church. And we will stand before him. So we are the objects of his kingship. Our heavenly king desires complete obedience, not for our own benefit, but for his. Does he have the right to be our king? Absolutely. There must be a breaking down first before there is going to be a building up. Even for the saved, if we desire true revival, there must be tearing down of selfishness and self-desires and ambitions that are not part of what God has. When we have ice on the sidewalk, we break it and remove it. Sometimes it's cold and very difficult. I was watching a man the other day taking a scraper and scraping the ice off his sidewalk so he could lay a little salt down. And sometimes we get like that. Our hearts get hard, and sometimes we get an exaggerated opinion of ourselves, but we also get an exaggerated opinion of how we are doing before the Lord. And when someone says, how are you doing? And we say, great. How are you really doing great? No, you're not. We're all struggling. We may think we have all the answers. We do not. We need him. We need our king. So there must be a breaking down of the fallow ground so the righteous rain can fall from above. I think about how that the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 2 through 6, says, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God, for he took away the altars of the strange gods in the high places, and he broke down the images, and he cut down the groves, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God and their fathers, and to do the law and the commandments. And also he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. In other words, there was peace because they worshiped one God, the God of heaven. That's the origin of his kingship. It's from above. The object of his kingship, if you would, would be you and me. He's desiring for you to come to him. All of your problems and difficulties and everything you're going through today is because he's calling you to himself. And then you can say, I know that I can trust him, and I want to give him all of the pain and all of the troubles that I have. I was preaching at a, at a funeral just this last week on Thursday, Thursday and, and thank you for praying for me because I sensed the power of God. It was standing room only. I've never seen something like this before. Nobody left. The place was full. It was packed. You couldn't even get around in this funeral home. 
and the person wasn't a great Christian. They were just a Christian, but they weren't great. Let me tell you something, folks. You can be a Christian and be the almost unfriendly person if you're not careful. You can say, well, I'm taken care of. Everything's okay with me. Some of the friendliest, most sweetest, most lovingly people are not just Christians that are on fire for God, but they're Christians and they're having troubles and struggles. I'm talking about relationship problems. But they're the most loving people. We're missing it sometimes because we think that we're okay when we're really not. Our king knows our condition and he wants to help us. And sometimes we have chambers of our heart that we think we can hide from God. And, and I don't think necessarily we're hiding it from God for a bad reason. We say, God, don't go there. It hurts so bad that I don't want to talk about it. It hurts so bad that I don't want anybody to know. As I started to give an illustration about how that God allows burdens to come into our lives, I watched the congregation. I saw a man sitting in the back. And I could barely see him because all of the people standing. And he was sitting next to somebody that I knew. And I watched his eyes begin to fill up with tears. And he hadn't cried for years. But at a funeral, he wept before God. And God is speaking to him. And God is drawing him and saying, I want you to be part of my kingdom. But you got to humble yourself. There's no prideful punks in his kingdom. There's no educated elites in his kingdom. In his kingdom, there are humble servants, people that are average people, common people, people like you and me. That's part of his kingdom. I need to move on. As we talk about the origin of his kingship, talk about the objects of his kingship, I want to just talk about the obligation, and it's my shortest, my shortest one. I wrote just a little bit on it. But let me tell you something. This is not just a temporary obligation. <laughs> he is not obligated to you just for a short period of time. But let me turn that around. You are not obligated to him just for a short period of time. Not just for a little time till you get better health and then you're going to go your own way. You draw close to him because you've got some issues because you can't pay any bills. And so you draw close to him for a little while. You got some relational issues, maybe going through a divorce or, or having someone pass away and your heart is so burdened and heavy that you go to him. And as soon as you get your strength back, you walk away from him. Your obligation to the king is forever because his obligation to you is forever. The Bible says, very clearly that he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and the kingdom there shall be no end. Isaiah 9, 7, we're so familiar with 9, 6, but let me just read 9, 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. Let's go back to James because he was strong. In James chapter 1, verse number 21, he said, Wherefore, lay apart all your filthiness and your superfluity and your naughtiness and receive the meekness of the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The obligation to him is so powerful. We were hunting. It's been quite a few years, maybe 20 years ago, and my dad was with us, and the boys were all with us, my brothers. We liked to go way up where it cost a lot of money to stay in a cabin. We used to do that. We used to like to spend $1,000 just to go hunting. I don't like to do that anymore. I filled up my truck yesterday, so I'm really thinking about getting a motorcycle or a moped. So if you hear this little, here comes Pastor. But we were up hunting, and, and we were always told that if you, if, you, if you get lost, guys, I want you to shoot your gun up into the air three times. Shoot once. Wait a little while. Shoot again. Wait a little while. And shoot again, and we'll know that's a sign. My dad had me so scared that if I go too far into the woods, that the woods were going to suck me in. So I would walk into the woods early in the morning, just far enough so that no one else could see me, just wait till it got light, then I'd go in the field. 
I remember there was a deer stand that I had built it ourselves. And can you believe this? We built these, I built this deer stand out of tobacco poles and barns. How many of you have ever seen tobacco poles and barns? Okay, pretty strong wood. They've been endured through the years. So we made these stands, and then we put them together and put them in a truck, three of them. We took them all the way up north. We drug them all the way back into the woods. And we would put them up. No wonder I got a bad back. I mean, that stand would be higher than the highest part of that corner up there. And I would put that up against the tree. I'd climb up there. Man, I was like the king of the woods, you know. And I remember one time we were hunting up there, and my brother said, uh, hey, Dean, you got a deer yesterday. Can I use your stand? I said, sure. You go ahead and use it. And he got up and little red-headed Darren got up in the, my stand, and I said, Darren, let me tell you something, though. Make sure you make some marks, you know, so you know how to get back to the road. So he said, no problem. So he said, go ahead. It was in the afternoon hunt, so he left in about 2 o'clock, maybe a little bit earlier than that. So I went down the road a little bit and hunting with my other brother and my father, and we were all in the woods, and it was getting dark, and pretty soon it gets kind of weird up there. We were up by Glidden. Anybody know where Glidden is? You know where Butternut is? Park Falls, and then Glidden, and then Butternut. And then there's who know what's in those woods, you know. Because some people have been lost there, and they never have been found. That's what my dad told me. I was thought, what if I come upon one of those guys that was lost and was never found? And what if, I, what if he hurts me? I'm serious. I'm a little skinny kid up there hunting, a little freaked out about that statement. But Darren knew that if he got lost, he'd be in trouble. And so we put him up in the tree stand, and he was hunting up there. He had a great time, but it got dark. Pretty soon the coyotes were barking a little bit, and that didn't scare us too bad until the wolves started to bark a little bit, howl. And so we got together, and we said, you know, everybody's back. It's wonderful except for Darren. And so we really didn't know where he was. We couldn't hear him. We started hollering for him, and so everybody got their trucks down into this little valley, and where I was, there was, I, I, I found this spot because I followed bear tracks to it. There was a crack in these big rocks. I think the bear was in there, I think. But I was hunting on top of them. And I, and I remember thinking about Darren thinking, you know, I thought, when was he going to make it out? Well, it was dark, man, about an hour after dark, and we still didn't have, still didn't have any sign of Darren at all. And all of a sudden I heard bang, 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 bang three times. That's not how you're supposed to do it. And you don't put the gun up here either. Uh, but we could hear him way in the distance and make a long story short. We waited and we waited and we waited. And his voice was getting further away instead of closer. Uh, he was in the swampy area in the woods. He was in the part where some guys get lost and never come back. So I took my old Dodge pickup truck and I went to a hill and I parked and I turned the lights on. See the light. And he starts running through the woods. And, and by the time he got back to the to the road, he had shot shells off. Bing, bing, bing. Bing, 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 bing. You know, bing, 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 bing. I mean, if a wolf come on time, he would know. What was he going to do if a wolf came or if a coyote got? And he didn't really care about his rifle anymore or the condition of it. He just wanted to get out of there because he was lost. He was looking for those lights and drawing toward those lights. Finally, he got to the place where we could hear him, and I went in about 50 yards into the woods, and I picked up my brother. He couldn't hardly walk, and he was bawling. He placed him next to the, my dad. My dad was standing there. My, my dad had already watched his brother drown, and two of his brothers were murdered, and my dad thought he was going to lose him. He hugged him and held him, and It's, it's pretty difficult for me to, to, to talk about how he felt, because I don't know how he felt. But I think he kind of felt like a person who is in the world system, lost, nowhere to go. And, and the light was there on the hill, and you were trying to get to it. And, and all of the briars and all of the things were trying to hold you back, and all of the spooky sounds and all the things of the world were entangling you and keeping you away from the lights. But the light's there. The understanding is that Jesus is that light. And the understanding is that his kingdom is full of his people. And once you reach it, by the way, it's by faith. 
There's nothing but love for you there. Think about it for just a moment. How he felt. Now, Darren never went back hunting in those big woods ever again. In fact, the next day was Sunday. You know what he did? He got some Captain Crunch and a big bowl of cereal and sat and watched cartoons. 18, 19 years old. He just, it just freaked him out. Well, that's what the world will do to you. Or me. And the only hope is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God. I said it recently on social media. America is not the kingdom of God. If we're putting our faith and our trust in Trump, I mean, good night. Look what we have right now in our precious land as leaders. Oh, my word, I am so embarrassed and ashamed, to be honest to you. We can do better than this. Wilton Howell could do better than what they're doing. Anybody could do better than what they're doing. But this is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. There is really no beginning and no end. It is forever. And we're going to reach it someday. Whether it's through death or whether it's through the rapture, we're going to be in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I hope that you have him as your king. I hope you've trusted him as Lord and Savior. Not just a, a religion. Not just a five steps to peace. I hope you've embraced him as your Lord and Savior and your friend. Personally. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Have you come to Jesus? You know who he is, but maybe you've never opened your heart to him. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, come in. I'm opening the door of my heart. Would you come in? I want to be part of your kingdom. I believe. Forgive me of my sin. And I turn from my sin to you. I turn from my idols, whether they're the idols of fleshly desires or Whatever it is, I give it all to you. I, forgive me of all of that, and I embrace you. If you've done that, praise the Lord. But if you haven't, why haven't you? He's been calling you since you were born. Come unto me. I'll be your king. Maybe this morning would be the morning that you'd say, I need Jesus as my Savior and my Lord and my King. Then why don't you come? If you're a man, I'll have a man show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure. And if you're a woman, I'll have a woman show you. But maybe you just need to come and kneel down and pray. With every head bowed, won't you stand just for a moment? We're going to have an invitation. Father, I pray that you would bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. God establish you when we make your way up here. I want you to close our service with a word of prayer. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll have the Lord's Supper. I want you to come be part of that. At 5 o'clock, I'll be meeting with the deacons. 
There's a special business meeting. I'm not sure if it was in the bulletin, but there is one next week. And so we want to vote on a few things for missions. God established who's worked hard to put together um, our missionaries, all of them, who gets what, um, more of, of uh, organizing and helping us. We have nine or eight that are in part of that program now. I think we have nine. And uh, they have several missionaries, each person. And so we, we get together and, and want to do more for missions. And I believe God has directed this because the world may change overnight even a little bit differently than we've known it in the next few months. We don't know. So I want to make sure we're connected to our missionaries and letting them know we love them and care for them. And so pray for the missionaries. But be back tonight at 6 o'clock for the Lord's Supper, 5 o'clock for a meeting. And then remember, we have a business meeting. It's just going to take real quick next week after the service. It's just going to vote on putting money from the missions fund toward something that will help us in the hallway to keep an understanding of the missions more. So once you come, close our service with a word of prayer, if you would. See you back tonight, 6 o'clock. Oh, that's right. We're going to take up an offering for the people downstairs for Anna. That dear lady. You go ahead and sit down right now. Let's do a real quick offering. Can you guys come on up here if you would? Bring those plates. This is going for Anna. I almost forgot. Who said that offering? Who said it? Okay, you get a Big Mac, buddy. My aunt gave me a Big Mac one time that she was in the back of her car for a couple days. So I went over to, I went over to McDonald's. I was only 14. I said, this one's cold. Can I have another one? And they gave me another one. Let's pray for the offering. Father, bless this offering. Father, use it to help not only the financial condition of Anna, but it'll help her heart to know that we care. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. I'll meet you at the door. Shake your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for the uh, missionaries and workers you have in uh, the Ukraine and Russia as well. Pray that um, you keep continue to work. I was glad to hear on some of those videos yesterday that indeed you are working even in the war zone people are being saved. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us to stand up for our King in our workplaces and in the whole week. I pray that we come back for the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.